Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. My name is Darby Dickerson, and I'm the Dean here at UIC Law. I want to welcome everyone to the first of our two Constitution Day presentations. This is also the kickoff of the Civic Engagement Year at UIC. Constitution Day is actually tomorrow, September 17th, but we're holding programs today to accommodate both our classes and our speaker schedules. Constitution Day is a federal holiday that commemorates the signing of the U.S. Constitution on September 17, 1787. I want to thank Dick Simpson, Professor of Political Science, for his work on this program, and also to acknowledge the Civic Engagement Core group of Evan McKenzie, Stephanie Whitaker, Spencer Long, Nikki Gottlieb, and Joe Horrett. For all of the technical and logistical support for this program, I want to thank Tim Orovec from the Office of the Dean here at the Law School. Before I address the current program, I invite you all to join us again at 5 p.m. for a program titled Suspicion Cascades, Race, Policing, and the Criminal Justice with Professor Song Richardson, who is Dean at the University of California, Irvine School of Law. As Professor Simpson noted as people were coming into the program, if you have questions for our current speaker, please type them in the Q&A box as opposed to the main chat. After the main presentation, Professor Simpson will moderate a Q&A session with this afternoon's speaker. Also, as a reminder, please take all necessary steps you have to for your vote to count in the November election. We're going to take the links from the PowerPoint slide in that regard and post them in chat in a few minutes. And now I'm thrilled to introduce you to our current program on Korematsu versus US, upholding our civil liberties and the constitution with Karen Korematsu. Ms. Korematsu is the founder and executive director of the Fred T. Korematsu Institute and the daughter of the late civil rights icon. Fred Korematsu was a national civil rights hero in 1942, at the age of only 23, he refused to go to the U.S. government's incarceration camps for Japanese Americans. After he was arrested and convicted of defying the government's order, he appealed this case all the way to the Supreme Court. In 1944, the court ruled against him, arguing that the incarceration was justified due to military necessity. The decision was widely criticized and has been repudiated by modern courts. In 1983, his conviction was overturned in a federal court in San Francisco. That was a pivotal moment in civil rights history. Since her father's passing in 2005, Ms. Korosbatsu has carried on his legacy as a public speaker, educator, and civil rights advocate. She established the Institute in 2009 to advance racial equity, social justice, and human rights for all. Please join me in giving a virtual welcome to Karen Korosbatsu. Thank you for being here with us today. Well, <laughs> thank you. Thank you, uh, Dean Dickerson. And uh, thanks for the applause, uh, Professor Simpson. That's very kind. Um, I'm, I'm thrilled uh, to be with all of you. And um, thank you for the University of, of um, Illinois, uh, Chicago, to invite me and uh, John Marshall School of Law to speak to you. Um, you know, the uh, Constitution Day is uh, very important to me. And, uh, and in fact, um, in 2010, uh, the legislative bill uh, was signed by Governor Schwarzenegger that established Fred Korematsu Day of Civil Liberties and the Constitution for the state of California in perpetuity. Now, it's, uh, it's on January 30th, which is my father's birthday. Uh, it's not a holiday, uh, but we're working on it. Uh, and across this country, we are also uh, working on that effort. Uh, the Fred Korematsu Day of Civil Liberties in the Constitution uh, is honored and recognized uh, and promoted in the state of Hawaii, uh, the Commonwealth of Virginia, uh, the state of Florida, uh, and, uh, and New York City. Um, also um, honors that day. And there have been other states and governors that have issued proclamations. Um, we have several different legislative bills uh, in different states. And so that's uh, the effort because 
it's it's you know it's wonderful to have the day as um, an honor for my father, but it's about his you know the 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 emphasis is on um, our civil liberties and the Constitution, which obviously we all know is is what we need to uphold now, and and that takes work. We can't be complicit um, and and think that someone else is going to do that. So we, um, you know, we're thrilled to have the day. We started off with K through 12 curriculum um, and now work with um, community colleges and higher education across this country uh, to, uh, to promote um, the, the, the day and the meaning and to have diversity because we have Martin Luther King Jr. Day and Cesar Chavez and Rosa Parks and where was the Asian American um, that represented you know, that community to show the diversity um, and inclusion in this country. Uh, Asian Americans is the fastest growing population in the United States. And, uh, and we all want to be represented. So, um, uh, you know, it's unfortunate that my father never knew about this, um, but uh, I, I think he would be happy. He was a very, he was a humble and kind, soft-spoken, uh, person who would give you the shirt off his back if you needed it. Uh, and sometimes people took advantage of his kindness and generosity, uh, which I learned, you know, and saw. So I was always trying to protect him when I was much older. Uh, but, you know, he grew, he was born in Oakland, California, uh, in the San Francisco Bay Area. And so therefore he was an American citizen. And his parents, my grandparents, immigrated from Japan. Um, you know, at the late, um, early 1900s, uh, first my, my grandfather and then my grandmother came later and she was something called a picture bride uh, and, and, and landed in Angel Island. And that's when they would, uh, because there was really no community of women when the men's first, Japanese men's first um, started to arrive on the West Coast. And uh, and so they would send pictures back um, and uh, of, of the of, you know, possible brides or husbands. Uh, and then the women would come to, um, you know, to marry them in, uh, in, in America. But in some cases, or in a lot of cases, I mean, they tried to do this by proxy in Japan, but the, the US government didn't recognize that. So they had to get married all over again in this country. Uh, and fortunately, my, um, my, my grandfather looked like his picture uh, because in some instances, men would send over photographs of much younger men. And so when the women, the brides came and arrived, the men didn't look like their picture. So there was, you know, these kinds of family issues also take, take place, uh, which is part of our, you know, part of our history. Uh, and my grandfather had a, a, a cut flower nursery uh, in, in uh, the East Bay. And, and so my father grew up just like any other American kid. And he had Caucasian friends and liked to hang out with them. Uh, but he did learn about the Constitution in high school. He was paying attention that day, which I try to uh, always uh, uh, encourage everyone to know about our Constitution, to know about our rights, because it's important. Uh, and so, you know, with, with this conflict and with what was happening um, in Asia, with Japan invading China, uh, my father thought, oh, there was, you know, kind of something up. But certainly the bombing of Pearl Harbor was a surprise, you know, to most everyone. Uh, and, uh, and, and so when Executive Order um, 9066 was issued uh, on February 19th, 1942, my father was quite surprised because as an American citizen, he thought he had rights. You know, remember I said he learned about, uh, about the Constitution and about, about rights that you have as an American citizen. And, you know, as many of you know, all due process of law was denied. No one ever had their day in court. Uh, no one was charged with a crime. No one had uh, an attorney to represent them. Uh, and so, you know, they were just, uh, you know, locked up. And my father thought this was wrong. He, he was an American. What does it mean to be an American in this country? And, you know, it's, your possessions are, are taken away from you. 
Uh, people sometimes only had 48 hours notice to decide what they're going to take with them to carry in two hands. Um, and they would have to leave it behind or try to sell it on maybe, you know, five cents on the dollar if they were lucky. And it, 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 was, it was a terrible time in this, in this country uh, because it, it, the, of the hardship. And the, you know, people first had to report in these detention assembly centers up and down the West Coast, which most of them were converted um, uh, racetracks and horse stalls. So all they did was whitewash the horse stalls. Uh, there's dirt on the floor, maybe a light bulb, an iron cot, you know, blanket. That's about all you you had. And you know, there was dysentery. It was, you know, we treated we treat animals better than we treated the Japanese Americans. Uh, and uh, it, it was it, it, terrible um, conditions. And you know, the it was really a violation of human rights. Uh, and uh, so my father refused to report uh, to the uh, detention assembly location. And however, he was uh, spotted and arrested about 30 days later after, already, uh, after his family and everyone else had reported. Uh, and he was you know, moved around from jail to jail and ended up in federal jail in uh, San Francisco. And there was this one man named um, Ernest Bessick who was the executive director of the Northern California affiliate of the ACLU that read about my father in the newspaper and was looking for a test case. He thought that the Japanese American incarceration was unconstitutional. So he visited my father in jail and asked my dad if he'd be willing to take his case, if need be, all the way to the Supreme Court. And my, and my father thought, Wow, by the time that this case gets to the Supreme Court, certainly the Supreme Court would see this as unconstitutional. So he said yes. And, uh, and, then, and then after his bail hearing, he was taken over to the uh, Tanferan racetrack, the detention assembly prison center where, where everyone was from the Bay Area. And, uh, and actually the man there in the community uh, decided to have a meeting uh, to uh, determine whether or not my father should carry on finding his case, but they didn't invite my father. And, uh, and then afterwards, uh, my father's oldest brother uh, told um, my dad that they all thought that my father should not continue fighting. And, uh, but my, my father was one of these people with quiet convictions. And he just, it didn't deter him. He was gonna keep on fighting. He didn't say anything. He, he just was disappointed. And, uh, and so he was vilified and ostracized from his own Japanese American community, but he never gave up. And no one wanted to, to associate with him because they thought some harm might come to them. And he went it alone. And even when they were all transferred to one of the 10 major um, incarceration camps, it was in Topaz, Utah. Here again, no one wanted anything to do with my father. And actually growing up, my, my brother and I were never part of the Japanese American community. We were not part of the, the Japanese American Citizens League. And, uh, and, and until his case uh, was reopened in 1983, you know, that that did, that did change. Uh, and, uh, and so, but he, he was never, my father was never bitter or angry. Um, I know that's hard to believe, but he, he wasn't, he, he didn't even utter a swear word. I can swear like a trooper, but you know, he didn't. And, uh, but he believed he had principles. He had moral principles of right and wrong. You know, that's something that we need to focus on in this country. And for all of you that are listening, what are your moral principles? When you have to make those tough decisions, you know, how, what are you going to do? You can go down one path or you can go down another. And, uh, and you have to know yourself because it's also important in law. You know, when I first started speaking and um, I was asked to speak to, to judges even and federal judges, uh, you know, as well as law schools and universities and schools. I thought, 
well, what am I going to, I'm not an attorney. What am I going to talk about? And it's talking about my father and the type of person that he was and what we all need to think about um, in our lives because it's important to know ourselves uh, so that we can make those decisions, whether you go into law, go into policy, you know, and do other things in life that, it, you know, you want to live by your own convictions of right and wrong. And you all know it, you are now at, at an age when, uh, when those kinds of issues are confronted, um, you know, whether you want to wear a mask or not, uh, what, what you're going to, what you're going to do about social distancing, about, you know, I, I mean, I was in college, so, you know, sororities and fraternities and whether you're going to gang together, um, you know, you have to think about others as well. And, uh, and so, you know, also the backstory to the Japanese American incarceration, uh, was about agriculture. Now the Japanese Amer the Japanese nationals, um, like my, my grandfather, were doing so well when they started in the agricultural business. He was growing flowers or people were in the, up and down the West Coast growing uh, uh, produce, um, that there was an outcry by other farmers who were saying, oh, they're taking away our jobs. Um, they should be sent back home. And so there was that grassroots underlining to the to this executive order so it's important it's important to know our history you know when you're making these decisions it's not just i mean rule of law certainly is important and what we need to uphold but we need to know our history and you know because uh, uh different ethnicities from the time of our um, indigenous american indian uh friends have been marginalized and discriminated against uh, and so, you know, with, with the incarceration, um, you know, my father ended up in Detroit, Michigan, um, and that's where he, he met and married my mother, and then they came back to, to California. Uh, but my, my father just carried on with his life, and he led his life by example. He was involved in Boy Scouts, in the International Lions Club, in our church, he was, you know, civically engaged. My mother was in Girl Scouts, Boy Scouts, PTA, um, all these other other uh, uh, volunteer um, organizations that I encourage everyone to be a part of. I mean, at least now we have organizations where we can where we can do that. And you, you know, you. It happens at different times in your life. Sometimes you have a little bit more time. Sometimes you have less time because you have to focus on your studies. Uh, but, you know, just keep that in mind because that's part of being civically engaged. It's, it, that's part of being an American. You know, we have this privilege and we talked about voting. You know, other countries, I mean, they're struggling. I mean, we're still struggling with voting, you know, rights in this country, obviously. Um, and then we all need to be um, activists in, in helping to make sure that everyone is, who, who can vote is able to vote. Uh, you know, that's, uh, that's really what's so important right now. And, uh, you know, it's, in 1944, on, on December um, 18th, 1944, was when the Supreme Court uh, gave their decision about Korematsu versus the United States. And it was not unanimous, as many of you know. It was a six to three decision. And that's very important because uh, just, Justice Robert Jackson referred to my father's Supreme Court case as this lies around like a loaded weapon, ready for anyone to pick up and use with a plausible cause. And, uh, and, and, they, and actually my father's case was cited after 9-11 as a possible reason to round up Arab and Muslim Americans and put them in American concentration camps again. And Justice um, uh, um, uh, Murphy, Frank Murphy, called it the ugly abyss of racism. Think about that. Ugly abyss of racism. That's a, that's a very strong phrase and, and, and pinpoints what that um, incarceration was. And, uh, and uh, Justice um, Owen Roberts said it was just unconstitutional. So reading these, these opinions, these dissenting opinions are also important. Um, and learning how to write 
is so important because your words matter. It has impact. Uh, and, you know, it, my father was so totally disappointed uh, in, in the decision, of course. And, you know, he, he had issues. I mean, he had housing issues and he had um, uh, employment issues. Uh, and so that's um, th how he had to live his life. And, and, and it wasn't really until I was in high school that I even knew about my father's Supreme Court case. Uh, a friend of mine, a Japanese American friend, there was only about six Asian Americans in a school of 2,500. Uh, and she was giving a book report um, and, uh, and you know, she got up in front of the class and was talking about the, the Japanese um, American internment. And I thought, well, that's interesting. Uh, and then she said, um, uh, you know, but there was this one man who disobeyed the military orders and it ended up to be a, a landmark Supreme Court case called Korematsu versus the United States. Oh, that's my name. And I have 35 pairs of eyes turning around looking at me and I'm shrugging my shoulders thinking it's some black sheep of the family because she doesn't say Fred. And then after class, I said to, to my friend Maya, what's this about? And she says, well, this is about your dad. I said, no way. Somebody would have told me. So of course I go running home and confront my mother and I get the standard answer. Well, wait until your father gets home. Um, and, uh, and, and discuss this with him. And, and he worked, you know, long hours and two jobs sometimes, and it was eight o'clock in the evening. And I, I calmed down a little bit about that time and told him what happened that day. And he said, it happened a long time ago. And what he did, he thought was right. And the government was wrong. That clear and simple. And I could see this hurt going over his face and I couldn't ask him any more questions because it was like someone just sucked me in the stomach. Um, and it, it, you know, I didn't know how to, you know, it was back in, in the late sixties. So I didn't know how to process that. I mean, you don't have the, the law and order uh, type of, of television programs that are on, on now. And it, it, uh, it was, I could see it was a very painful subject. But I did not know until my father's case was reopened in, in 1983 that he had never given up hope that someday that he would be able to reopen up his Supreme Court case, but he just didn't know how to do that. Attorneys were expensive and my parents didn't really know any attorneys at the time. So when Professor Peter Irons, um, who had been de doing research in Washington DC to write a book about the World War II Supreme Court cases discovered this evidence along with another research, researcher, Aiko Hersh Yoshinaga, that proved there was no military necessity for the Japanese Americans, Japanese and Japanese Americans to be incarcerated. Um, they, he, he, was, he went after trying to look for my father. And, you know, very many people told, um, told him that, you know, no, that he doesn't want to talk about it. Uh, another director from the ACLU said, no, Fred doesn't want to talk about it. Um, but Peter was persistent and set up a meeting. And, uh, and then he showed this file to my father that was about an inch thick. And in it, it, it had the evidence that at the time of the Supreme Court decision, that the Department of Justice had lied to the Supreme Court, had altered evidence and destroyed evidence. So on that basis, they were able to reopen not only my father's Supreme Court case, but Gordon Hirabayashi, who was in Washington, and Min Yasui, who was in Oregon. Those two cases had to do with the, um, uh, with the curfew. Uh, and so they decided to, uh, the legal team was formed and uh, they decided to fight those cases in those three different courts. Now, I wanna tell you about the Quorum Novus team. Uh, and you know, it's, in 1983 was um, a long time ago, but I know there's not always, and you'll learn as maybe attorneys or even in life that you don't always have a, 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 a client attorney relationship that lasts forever. And this has lasted forever. But this legal team worked pro bono 
So I want to emphasize that, that your pro bono work, you know, down the road is so important uh, because they were, you know, they worked on this. They had some, many of them had jobs. So they worked on this at night. They worked on this on weekends, all this type of research. This is way before, you know, the 83, before really computers were that proficient. And uh, they didn't want to tell anybody because they had this evidence and they didn't want the government to have this evidence or to know that they, what they had. Uh, and so it was, it, it was so heartwarming to see that my father finally had his day in court. And as you know, one of uh, my father's um, uh, legal team members, um, attorney Don Tamaki said, you know, this was, was, this was the day in court on November 10th, 1983 that, that uh, for all Japanese and Japanese Americans, it, it represented their day in court as well. And actually my father took a risk in reopening up his case because again, the Japanese American community wasn't supportive. That was the time of the beginning of redress and reparations for the Japanese Americans. And they said to my father, Fred, if you do this you're, and you lose, you're gonna hurt our chances. But even though everyone was against him and his family didn't support him as well, his, his brother, he went ahead. And the legal team was his, really his support, his encouragement. Um, and so in, 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 as, as the Dean said in 1983, his federal conviction was uh, vacated. Now, of course, it stayed on the books uh, for, for uh, a while. Well, still on the books, I guess, so to speak. And uh, until we come to, uh, to Trump versus Hawaii. But my father never, you know, he, he always believed in, in, uh, in this country. And he didn't want the mistakes uh, in the past to be made again. So he, was, he even spoke out um, during the desert storm uh, when Arab um, Americans were being targeted. Uh, after 9-11, he was one of the first people to speak up along with the Japanese American Citizen League to, to remind the government that you, you know, they cannot do this. They cannot incarcerate Americans just because of the way they look or their religion. Uh, and that's, an, that's important to, re, to remember that we, you know, he, he worked with all different communities. Uh, he was an activist for everyone because that's how much he believed in this country and he just didn't want something like the Japanese American incarceration to happen again. And we come this close all the time to these kinds of, of issues. Um, and, you know, even, uh, even now, you know, with, with COVID, which we've all had to deal with, I mean, it's a worldwide p pandemic. It's, it's been outrageous to me to have um, my father's Supreme Court case, Korematsu versus United States, to, um, uh, to be referenced as a reason for um, uh, people not to have to stay home because of COVID. Oh, uh, a Supreme Court um, uh, justice in um, uh, Wisconsin said, uh, well, you know, they, uh, we can't force people to, to, to stay at home. You know, we did that to the Japanese Americans inside of my father's case. This is why it's important to learn your history, because the incarceration was, like I said, a human rights violation. They, you know, the word evacuation, now I can tell you, speaking to five-year-olds, they know the definition of evacuation. That is for your own safety. The COVID um, uh, regulations and policies was to protect ourselves and to uh, protect our families and uh, our communities to stay at home so this, this pandemic would not grow. It, it's not a violation of civil rights. It's, it's about you know, thinking what you can do for our own humanity. That's different. You know, people don't understand that uh, your human rights violations um, you know, uh, run a, a, a gamut of, of, of issues. And to stay at home because you and then the comfort of your home, not stripped from your home, not your possessions stripped away from you, um, not to live in, in a prison camp behind barbed wire, to eat um, food that's inedible, uh, to be treated uh, without dignity 
is not the same as staying at home to protect um, our health and uh, you know ourselves and our community and our families. Uh, and wearing a mask is is about respect, about respect for ourselves and respect for each other. Somewhere along the way, we have lost this this um, issue of respect of of really this you would think would be inherent in us. It has to be taught uh, to respect each other's differences. Um, and, and uh, you know, my father, he, when he made this decision to reopen up his Supreme Court case, he didn't do this just for himself. He did this for, for the Japanese American community. He did this, like I said, so this wouldn't happen again. So it's more than just yourself. When you do, when you take these stands, it's it it should be more than just yourself it's for your your betterment of of society um you know social justice is runs through all uh uh careers um and life and we need to be reminded that uh we're humans and that we should be working together not working against each other um, we can have our opinions. We can agree to, this is, to disagree, absolutely. But to find common ground and, and to work towards those issues that are going to make um, you know, our lives better is what's, what's important. Uh, you know, this, um, at this, during this time, of course, I think what, what COVID has done, um, especially with, with Black Lives Matter, is to really look at our, our issues of racism, right? This is all about racism. I mean, this, this long history in our country of marginalizing different ethnicities, like I said, the, the indigenous you know, American uh, Indians and uh, the, uh, the Chinese, like the, the Chinese Exclusion Act, the Japanese Americans, um, you know, with the incarceration, uh, the Muslim ban, uh, this is all about our, our really our systemic racism. Um, and, you know, I think we've been kind of numb to, to racism over the years. And with COVID, I, and people getting out there to protest. Now, you know, I don't believe in violence. Um, I believe in taking a stand. And, 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 and so now we have protests, which is good, but not destruction of property. That's not what that's about. Uh, that's not what the Constitution was, you know, states, is, is you don't have the right to destroy somebody else's property. Yes, you want to get people's attention, but you do it the right way. And you, and you work together to, to, make, to change that kind of policy. So all of you who are studying now, I'm hoping that you will look at these different policies um, that Im impact our lives whether you get into law or you get into government or even working in, in the, in the you know, parent teachers student association, these are all policies that impact our lives. Uh, and we want to be sure that um, we treat it all with, with respect and have the diversity um, you know, and inclusion that we, that we need to, to, to move forward. We need to change the culture of this country. And the only way to do that, um, it's not gonna happen overnight. Um, it's gonna take a lot of work. It's not gonna be easy. You're gonna take you know, three steps forward, two steps back, that's life. Uh, I can tell you at this age, you know, I've had enough experience to, to, to know. And uh, you know, certainly I experienced racism growing up. So uh, it would be soon after the bombing of you know, Pearl Harbor, like December 7th. And the teacher would be talking about um, you know, the, the bombing of Pearl Harbor, how the Japanese were very bad people and they bombed Pearl Harbor. Well, don't you know that it was my fault for the bombing of Pearl Harbor? I couldn't ride the school bus. Go home, go back to where you came from. Hello? And we're hearing this still? What, why don't we learn these lessons? This is, this is, this is not what America is about. And, uh, and we need to, to challenge those people to say, no, you can say, no, that's not right. You know, have the courage of your convictions and say, no, that's not right to discriminate against people, to, um, you know, to, to have these racist kinds of, of, of remarks. 
it, it's and 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 certainly all the the social media and what's out there is just alarming uh that you know we can we can say no you know we're not going to allow that or to turn it off or to get people to do something positive instead of negative the social media needs to be learned to be a positive tool not a negative tool that's not that's not why it was created um it was for communications and we're going to have to change policies there obviously but we need to work together to address those and make people accountable for their actions uh that that's what's you know so so important now and you know with you know with the with um with black lives matter you know we've had this you know anti uh, black you know harassment obviously but also along that way think about it anti-asian rhetoric with um the uh the covid be call, be calling the the chi the china flu or the chinese flu and then everybody who is asian american and there's many different uh micro ethnicities and asian americans so then they get you know uh blamed for the for the covid for the for the pandemic well that's you know just ridiculous because uh this is th this is an issue of of health it has nothing to do with ethnicity um it you know we still don't even know where all this stemmed from there's there's so many different opinions but what what is it what is important is you know how are we going to address those issues how are we going to uh you know make sure that people do get vaccines uh and it, you know these are the kinds of of issues that are important to focus on so it we've got a long road you know ahead of us and and it's about you know working together to recognize that uh that's how we're going to to uh to make change and you know my my father would be so disappointed at at at, at the um negative rhetoric that is still being voiced today uh because uh you know it's it's just not what he wanted for this country that he was hoping and i was hoping by the time i got to be this age that we would be in a better place but at least now we're recognizing that we have systemic racism that we need to address it that we have to know our history um in order to 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 do that uh and you know it's not just knowing about um for law school just knowing about cases i mean whether it's board of education or koromatsu or pussy versus ferguson it's about you know the meaning behind them about the experiences um and the way people have been treated in in the past uh and you know fortunately we had the the redress and 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 reparations for japanese americans and i will say because i've been asked this um that i believe this is my opinion um uh, that we do need um uh some type of you know redress and reparations for the um the african americans that became slaves in this country now it's going to be very difficult to do an individual um type of of reparations and i have to tell you the way that it was compromised where there had to be a compromise was that you still had to be living in order to receive reparations so you know fortunately my father was but my grandparents had passed away uh many people had passed away there was nothing given to their families so you had to be living in order to receive any type of reparations but what was important to them was was the, the apology the apology from the from the government the apology from from president reagan who said he apologizes on behalf of this nation because everyone had lost their dignity to be blamed because you looked like the enemy to be to be blamed for the bombing of pearl harbor you know that's painful it's it we're, we're humans we're it's painful and we have to remember that what type of pain are we causing but we need to recognize um uh the mistakes of the past and whether it's putting funds into some type of public education program for african americans um you know certainly we were discussing that but we need to address this uh issue because if, if we don't 
if we don't make these changes, then we can't go forward. And, uh, and it's important that we, you know, try to find some type of compromise. Not everyone's going to be happy. Believe you me, that's life. Um, you know, I would have loved to have my grandparents been able to be honored with, with reparations. It didn't work that way. But, you know, we have to focus on what's important. What's, what's, the, what's the issue that's going to make the change uh, in this country? Because, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's not going to, to get better unless, unless we do. And uh, we, um, we just have that so much work to do. I mean, that's what gets me up in the morning. Um, also, what I'm uh, promoting right now uh, through the Cormontu Institute, we focus on education. I'm trying to do all this and fundraise at the same time. And believe you me, for a nonprofit organization, it's a huge struggle. Uh, we're just trying to, to survive. But we focused on K through 12 education, talking about the incar Japanese American incarceration, my father's fight for justice, and racial justice. So we're now really focusing on racial justice and, uh, and that education and that type of, of curriculum. But ethnic studies, ethnic studies, if you've taken an ethnic studies class, you know, that's great for you, but we need to, to, to do that because that's how we're going to, to know and appreciate about each other. So um, I know we've got some questions um, that people want to ask, uh, but I'm going to leave you with my father's words. Remember to stand up for what is right and when you see something wrong, protest, but not with violence, otherwise they won't listen to you. But don't be afraid to speak up. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was uh, wonderful. There are a large list of questions, and for those of you that haven't yet discovered it, you can put your questions in the Q&A, not in the chat, but in the Q&A section. Uh, one of the questions that was uh, more specific and personal was, did the Japanese ever accept your father and did his brother? Um, th that's an excellent question. I'm glad that was asked. Thank you. Um, it, it, was, it was interesting. The, the day in court on November 10th, 1983, when my, it, when my, and, and read Judge Marilyn Hall Patel's decision. I didn't get a chance to cover that. Um, but, because uh, it's relevant today. But, all the, all the community that was there came rushing up to congratulate my father. Um, they were all crying in the courtroom because of what it meant. Um, and my, my dad could have very well said, well, Japanese American community, I didn't, you didn't want anything to do with me. Why, you know, why should I have anything to do with you? But he wasn't like that. And he's, he was invited to the JACL to speak and other organizations across this country. And he, he was not bitter or angry and he did not hold a grudge. That was, you know, it's pretty magnanimous to not be bitter and angry. Um, but he welcomed everyone with open arms and he just was glad to, to see that justice was, was finally done. And his brother, we, you know, that was, it was, I mean, there wasn't really any big separation, but we were still close as a, as a family um, uh, and all my cousins. So we're, we're very close, you know, my, all, my, of course, my father was, a, was actually the last um, um, one to pass away out of, out of the four brothers. Um, but uh, we're all still very close. And my mm -hmm. grandfather did not hold, sorry, my grandfather did not, you know, he, he did not hold a grudge either. Um, unfortunately, my grandmother died on my first birthday, so I never got to know her. We have a lot of questions. One of them is, what is your stand on ICE, and uh, is it reminiscent of your father's case? Well, yes, I'm, uh, I'm totally against ICE. Um, you know, sign me up. Uh, you know, it's, it, and it is. I mean, this is another, you know, another uh, example of, of history repeating itself, right? In a di you call it a different name. So in 1942, they called it military necessity. Now we call it national security. You know, these euphemisms, they, the words may change, but the issues are, are, are still there or maybe even worse. And, you know, you're still targeting um, and still, you know, uh, racial profiling and, and the, the racism um, is at the root of all of that. And a very specific question, were interred Japanese allowed to vote during the 40s? 
That's an excellent question. Um, it was um, hit and miss. It was not. Um, it was not consistent, and and the majority of them um, were were not able to. And even actually now, fortunately, since my father um, had served his, um, his 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 bail sentence, uh, and that's what he received, uh, but still had a federal record. In, in California, because that's where they moved back to, he could still vote, even though he had a federal conviction. Now, there are some states, and I probably should know, know them, where whether, you know, if you have are in prison or have a federal record that you can't vote. Um, one of the uh, questions, which is similar to the one you answered on ICE, is what can we do about the suppression of the uh, Uyghur uh, Muslims in China? Um, wow, that's, um, that's uh, certainly a, uh, uh, any of those who are studying uh, international law, uh, and I hope you are, um, that's, that's really um, uh, an issue that, that needs to be encouraged um, in this country uh, with, our, with our diplomats and, and with, you know, and actually with the United Nations. I feel that the United Nations in a lot of ways has failed us. And, uh, and that's where we need to, to make some change as well, because the United Nations um, should be, uh, you know, she's speaking out. And it didn't help that this president actually thought, you know, the, uh, the concentration camps in China were okay. You know, it's, this is the, the, you know, when we have political leaders who um, support this kind of action, uh, that's where we have failed. And, and, uh, and so it's, it's gonna be a fight. We have to keep you know, working as, as grassroots to, um, you know, to be sure that we are addressing that because it's, it's not, you know, with the Chinese government, it's very difficult because it's still a communist a country. And, and the only way you can make some inroads and some accountability really is through our, our diplomatic relations, which <laughs> I'm not sure, you know, that's kind of fall apart. And, uh, and also the UN, and no one's paying attention to that. So that's how you, you know, we're gonna to have to think of other creative ways to address these issues, but don't give up for goodness sakes, because these people are being persecuted right and left. And, uh, and it's, it, it, whether it's, you know, petitions or outcries or whatever, um, you know, after this election is over, I think that's something that we, we need to uh, definitely work on. But I'm gonna say, you know, we don't know what the results of this election is going to be. So that's why everyone needs to vote. But I think that unfortunately, no matter what, we are going to still see a divide in this country and we need to find a way to work together. Uh, throughout your father's experience, your mother was there by his side. Yes. How did your mother handle the social pressures, uh, particularly um, and the reactions, especially as a female Japanese American. Well, my now my mother was Caucasian. Okay. My mother was Caucasian. My mother was born in South Carolina. Uh, in fact, when uh, my parents and and she, my mother was a very smart woman. Uh, she re um, she received a a scholarship to att attend attend uh, Wayne State um, University. Uh, in Detroit, Michigan, uh, to work on her master's in microbiology. And that's where she, she met, my father was in Detroit, Michigan. Detroit, you know, the Midwest was very welcoming to Japanese Americans at that time. Um, and so I, you know, kudos to, to, to the Midwest. Um, and they met actually at a, at, through a, um, well, through a church, um, through a friend that my mother met her first Japanese American person, uh, Elma and uh, who introduced my, my father to my, to my mother. But, you know, my, I, my grandparents, I have to say, my maternal grandparents were very um, uh, respectful to everyone, to African-Americans, maybe that were even worked in, around them or with them. Uh, you know, it, it, my mother was, was the type of person that wasn't, you know, prejudiced. And, uh, and in fact, uh, you know, my grandparents didn't say anything against my mother when she decided to to marry my father, uh, and it, it um, they traveled from Detroit 
uh, back to California. They went oh, kind of north through um, the upper states. They, they really didn't find any discrimination in motels or anything, but they experienced more discrimination in California. And uh, there were a number of uh, questions related to um, both the Black Lives Matter movement, but particularly to uh, some of the violence. Uh, some of the people thought that maybe the looting of small businesses was bad, but maybe looting multi million dollar corporations was not as bad. Others were simply uh, concerned about the violence that was used. What, uh, how do you feel your father's stance on this violent approach to protest would be, and what is your stance? Well, as I said, he said protest without violence, and he really mean it, meant it. Um, and I and I take that stay, say that same stand. I mean, I, you know, it's it. We have it. Res, I talked about respect, and it's respect for other people's property. Now. You know, if for corporations, if you don't like the way that they are operating, then one, you don't support them through your dollars, right? Uh, through commerce, then you get other people to not support them. You get a group of people that either sign petitions or sign a letter that goes to the uh, the CEO and to make those those kinds of complaints. You know, it, it you're not going to get anybody's attention by destroying their property. I mean, the, you know, the Japanese Americans, their property was, was, was taken away from them, right? They, they lost houses, they lost property. Um, that's, that's, that's a violation of our principles. Uh, and you know, I under, you know, I understand it, but I don't accept it. There's other ways of, of protesting and, uh, and changing policy. So you do it, you, you have to dig a little deeper. Don't, you know, just assume that, that breaking glass windows is going to make the change because then you're not going to get the support of the of these um uh, commercial or uh um um uh companies that you know if if you want to make the change then we need to find another way um to either starve them by not not supporting them financially or doing it through policy so there's other ways of doing this it was just that's the easy way out and folks, you know, we we're, we got to get beyond just the easy way out of trying to destroy somebody's property. This is the very last question. Uh, first of all, uh, yes, we did record this session. And if you want to see it, you can see it on the UIC LawTube channel. Or those of you on the East Campus can contact me and I will send you a link um, for your classes on the East Campus. Uh, we had a bunch of questions about, do you think society has become less racist uh, now than compared back then? Um, and what would you say is the best advice for those seeking to make change? Uh, unfortunately, I think now it's more racist. And, uh, and we've seen this, you know, huge um, divide. But, uh, but, you know, the way to make change is, is actually to work together. You know, it's, it's very daunting sometimes to think, oh, well, I can't do anything myself. You have to work together. You work in groups. You work in organizations. Now there's the organizations around that you can join who are going to make those efforts. <coughs> Excuse me. At the time of the, of the 1942 incarceration, there were no groups speaking up. There was, you know, the, 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 even the national organization of the ACLU was against Mr. Bessick for taking on my father's case. Um, you know, the, uh, the Quakers were very peaceful. There was no one to speak up. Now we have the organizations that everyone can be a part of and find your cause and pick that and support it. And that's how we're going to make change. And then get people, you know, fundraise, get people to, to, uh, to donate to those organizations so that they can address these, these, these issues. Uh, so we're very lucky now, whether it's, you know, the ACLU or any kind of Muslim groups or, or, you 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 pick it that you know there we're all we're all in our own ways even my organization is 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 trying to make that kind of change and you do it through through your dollars through policy through volunteering thank you so much miss koromatsu uh, it's been a great honor to have you for constitution day it's the beginning of our year of civic engagement and civic action at the university of illinois at chicago and we're delighted that you could get us started on this path Hopefully we will join together to make the changes you've advocated. 
Thank you. And thank you, everyone. And remember, vote in census, or census first and then vote. <laughs> thank you.